But the actual basics of saving, investing are very easy to understand, but super hard to do. <laughs> it's about how do you sort of invest well? And a lot of that is to do, to do nothing. <laughs> don't react when markets are going up. And I think there's, I've met so, so many people from very wealthy families. Um, they've sort of grown up and they're, they're struggling with money now. These children, they didn't choose to come from a rich family. Hello and welcome to Humanising Finance, the podcast with me, Krista McGilvery. As always, we get under the skin of money. We expose the emotional, cognitive and psychological factors that may affect you and your money. Most importantly, we aim to leave you feeling empowered and with at least one nugget you can action immediately after listening to the podcast. Now today, I am thrilled to have Will Rainey, who is a writer and a speaker focused on helping parents teach their children about money. He's the author of children's book, Grandpa's Fortune Fables. I do love the name. His work has appeared in the Financial Times, iNews and the National News. His website, bluetreesavings.com, has helped thousands of parents start talking to their children about money. He has been invited to speak also at Fortune 500 Global Companies. Will, hello. Hello, it's great to be here. <laughs> thank you, thank you for joining me. I'm really thrilled. Um, I've been watching you, like I said, when we first connected for a while. Uh, no, fantastic. I, I was fantastic when I first saw you had a podcast and I remember I reached out. Um, I'm so glad to be a guest. Yeah, yeah, I, exactly. Like I, I've, I don't even know when I first came across you. It must have been ages ago. Um, maybe seeing your book pop up somewhere and I was like, oh, this is fascinating and I love your approach and I love that it is all friendly and, you know, all that good stuff. So when I did put the podcast together, you was, like I said, on my Trello board for the longest while. Oh, fantastic. So, um, really glad you're here. I mean, it'll be great to start kind of just to hear a bit more about you, um, kind of what got you into what you do and, yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, so I've started my career as an actuary. So for those who don't know what an actuary is, it's essentially an accountant who loves statistics. Um, so I used to work helping insurance companies and retirement funds look at their long-term risks and understand what kind of investments they should make. Um, so I did that in the UK for many years. And then in 2014, I moved with my company to Hong Kong. And so I took up a role of being the head of investment strategy for Asia, which is fantastic. Got to meet uh, and travel around Asia and helping, again, some of the largest sort of institutional uh, investors think about where they should invest their money. But then in around, I think it was around 2017, I was talking to uh, one of my clients and it was talking about my two young daughters. And they just kind of flippantly said, oh, enjoy this time with them. They only grow up once. And I thought... I know it's such a simple statement, an obvious statement, but it had a really big impact on me. So I really wanted to spend more time with my kids. So my wife and I have kind of put in a little bit of a plan. And then in 2019, we left our corporate jobs um, and said, right, we're going to do a bit of a mini retirement. And then we moved from Hong Kong to Vietnam, um, put the girls into international school and had this amazing experience. But whilst we were there, I really wanted to have a little project. And I... And it kind of struck me at that time that I felt so fortunate to be able to take this time off corporate work. And a lot of that was to do because we had some savings and investments that, again, most people had, didn't really have that. And I kind of reflected on why, why do we have that and most people didn't. It wasn't just because we worked in the finance industry because a lot of my people I, I knew in the industry w wouldn't be able to do what we're doing. So even though they know the knowledge, they weren't doing it. And it then came back to that my parents were savers and um, my wife's parents were also savers. And we kind of just kind of grew up with that. So I was like, right, I'm going to make sure that my children kind of grow up knowing about saving and investment. So as I had all this time with them, I sort of share some stories as they were going to bed. So I kind of wanted to make it a bit interesting. So I used to tell them stories. And then I started to share those stories with friends initially. And then I thought, right, I'm going to start um, sharing it with other people. So I, I started my, my website that you mentioned. Uh, and it seems to get really good traction because... I think a lot of parents want to teach their kids about money but have no idea where to start because they were never taught themselves. So I think it's been really well received and, and it's kind of just gone from strength from strength in from there. That's amazing. I love it. And I love the fact as well that you mentioned that people who work in the finance industry 
the world often assumes that they are all minted and they know exactly what they're doing with their personal finances and they really don't. I've worked with accountants myself. I'm an accountant and I've worked with accountants to help them be better with their money. So, um, good point. Yeah. yeah, no, it's a really interesting. And I think some of that is, A, some of it's quite uh, competitive in the financial service industry. So there's a lot of uh, one-upmanship and trying to show off how senior and, and well they're doing and success is kind of shown by how much you spend. Um, typically but also I think there's a bit of a mentality of because they do earn quite good money that they can always just earn some more <laughs> so as long as they spend it's fine they can just always earn more which is fine in the short term but to be able to do what my wife and I have been doing um, and having that more opportunity to do what you want when you want it you really do need to have that kind of savings and investing mindset which as I say they know the knowledge but the actions are, are surprisingly hard and, and as well it's just it's it's just a really good example of the fact you have to learn this stuff and i think a lot of people tend to beat themselves up about the fact that they maybe are not making good financial decisions don't know what to do and they kind of they, they, you know this narrative around i'm just stupid or i'm just a lost cause and it's like no you just need to learn this stuff that that's it you know yeah yeah no it's really interesting because again when i first started i started um because i had this investment background I thought, right, I'm going to teach my kids about investing and I'll show, tell all these other parents about investing because I thought that's something that they didn't, wouldn't know. So I thought, oh, I'll put my knowledge into the world and, and that would make everyone start investing. But then the more I spoke to families, the more I spoke to different people around, that it's not to do about the knowledge, it's about the action. So people that can't invest because they haven't got any savings. Okay, why haven't they got any savings? Because they've just gone from a youngest age a habit of spending and keeping up with the Joneses and that kind of mindset. And so I always say to people, money isn't really complex. I know some people feel it can be, and there there is definitely lots of different routes where it can become very, very complex. Yes. <laughs> but the actual basics of saving, investing, are very easy to understand, but super hard to do. <laughs> Even though, and it's really, it's like simple but hard and it's all about the actions, the habits, the mindset. And that's why I try and focus so much on getting parents to teach their kids. Because if kids can just grow up all from the get-go, <laughs> doing the, taking the right actions, thinking about money in the right way, it's going to be so much easier because they'll, they'll continue those habits and mindset into adulthood. And rather than what happens with most adults where you have to try and change habits and behaviours, which we know is just so, so ch hard, uh, hopefully kids with the, the right mindset and habits will have a huge advantage. Yeah, I, I like that. And as well, you know, the fact that you're teaching children or the information is going to the children, it then gives a greater lead time in terms of familiarity. It's, yes. You know, they've had this conversation about money from they were small. So there's less, I, I imagine, less fear and shame. And that kind of leads me on to the first question, I guess. You know, we hear originally the narrative around when children are seven years old, their money habits have already started to set in. But I also read that by the age of three, children have a grasp of money concepts. And I guess linking back to kind of what you do, what's your target age in terms of the children and why? So yeah, so the younger the better um, in that sense. So I've been, so I started to, probably talking to my daughters about money probably around when my youngest was about four years old. And, but even then, I've said to some parents, you can even start younger, even though if you're not talking about money, it's about patience, uh, it's about making choices um, and stuff. So I know some parents who have, even from, uh, I think it was like late two years old, they give their kids some like uh, TV time tokens. And so they say, well, you can watch TV, but you can only watch, I don't know, Peppa Pig uh, t five times this week. And here's your five Peppa Pig tokens. And you can watch them all in one day, or you can spread it out over the week. And again, just allowing them to make those little budgety choices. They soon make mistakes and learn and stuff. So it's the kind of actions, again, is more important than it talking about money, um, but from the youngest age. Um, so yeah, when I was, I, but even when my daughter was youngest was four, we didn't talk about money explicitly. We talked about, um, so I, I use this analogy of money being like seeds. So I say you can give these seeds away and that's just like spending, but you can keep the seeds. And if you actually plant some of those seeds, they turn into these trees, which produce more seeds. And the more that you keep planting and, and growing, you'll have this kind of financial forest. And so from the youngest age, they kind of got this very simple analogy of, of money. So even though they didn't really know what 
the planting was and what these trees were and what the seeds become when they were really young. But as they've kind of got older and we, they start asking questions, but even from that youngest age, they wanted to keep some of their money and put it, some of it into to what we call the blue trees, which is um, the sort of saving investments that we do for our, our daughters. But I quite like the fact that they asked some questions as they kind of grew up. Um, but from that youngest age is really important. It's really crucial. And that kind of the suggestions or the tips you just mentioned there was actually leading quite nicely into my second question, which is kind of the general approaches that you take um, or you advise people to take when it comes to grasping those financial concepts. And I like the fact that you've started with, it's not actually about the numbers. It's actually about, you know, understanding patience or the more overarching behaviours you need to exhibit to be good at money. Yeah, so that, that seed one works. And, but also, I, so in my, my blogs, which are read by parents, not by kids, but they have lots of stories and games and, and like analogies to make it fun uh, to talk about this. So a classic one is I have different characters for some topics. So when we're talking about like rich versus wealthy, which is a common, people don't know the, the difference. And yep. what, so for my mind, there's the kind of rich is what you spend your money on and you see the people and that's kind of like your Instagram stars uh, spending on their nice houses, etc. And I remember when I was young watching like MTV Cribs and they had the big houses. And, My gosh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and, but then, so you kind of, in the world, you kind of see these characters all around, but you don't see the wealthy characters. So the wealthy characters are those who kind of look after their money. They've got savings, they've got investments, um, but it's kind of in the background because they're not spending as much. It's not so much on Instagram and other places. So that's why when I'm writing these stories, I like to have these different characters. So in the book, Grandpa's Fortune Favors that you mentioned, um, you've got Grandpa who's wealthy and you've got this other character called Richie Raccoon. And once the children kind of see these two characters, then they can say, oh, which one do I want to be like? And most of, well, pretty much all the time, they want to be like Grandpa rather than this Richie Raccoon character. And it just makes it so much easier for them to sort of remember the story, the characters. And also, as I say, it shines a light on these kind of characters that do exist, but they're not in the, the limelight uh, in the real world. And so I find that they find that really engaging. I've got other characters. So, uh, one that's really sort of resonated has been about investing. And so I, one of my most popular blogs was about how to teach kids about investing. But subsequent to that, it's about how do you sort of just invest well and a lot of that is to do to do nothing <laughs> don't react when markets going up and so i have this character called mr lazy and so he just doesn't do anything he, not consciously but he just he's a bit lazy and his kind of forest that he's growing again using the tree analogy grows much bigger than others and so whenever i talk to my kids um about investing and they're like oh we just want to be like mr lazy um, and again it's nice i've heard i've heard other parents saying that They've talked to their kids about investing and they're talking about Mr. Lazy. And I just love it. It's just fun because clearly talking about the stock market or any kind of money in like the, the core is kind of draw, dull. It's a little bit arbitrary. But having characters and seeds and trees and birds and Mr. Lazies and all that makes it just so much more engaging for kids. Plus, it means that you can kind of go back to it relatively quickly to give them a refresh without it being a lecture. Because I don't think any child, let alone, well, I don't think many adults want to be lectured about money as well so uh, trying to keep it as fun uh, as possible has been the sort of what I've tried to do with my kids and, and hopefully as many families as possible. I love it and I, and I think as well you're changing the narrative around people who build wealth like you said with MTV Cribs <laughs> I can't believe you mentioned that like yeah <laughs> with things we see on the TV and the things that we're familiar with being you know I guess pumped in front of us yeah. that's what looks good right that's what we aspire to but I guess you're creating a narrative where you want to become like the person who is building wealth as much as they call Mr. Label or whatever their names are it's like you're creating it to be a positive thing for the child to look at then they want to be like them which yes. of course is going to make it so much easier yes yeah, I know exactly, and it's it's, yeah, I say it's, it's fun for them uh, to learn and, and kind of characters, and especially for my, my daughters, they're kind of getting involved when I'm coming up with these stories um, to try and input into that. But yeah, just to make it as easy, and spe especially the tree analogy works, because as I said, my kids kind of got it 
the analogy really early on, but as they got older, they could just kind of come back to it and say, Dad, what does it mean, these trees growing? What is it <laughs> that you... And that's, oh, okay, then you can kind of go into a bit about more detail about what it actually means in the real world. And so hopefully by the time they're 18, they've got <laughs> exactly what their forests and the, the seeds, etc. are. Thank you. Um, and when we obviously spoke originally about this podcast, I really wanted to touch a bit more about the difference that you've seen given that you're living in Thailand and you've lived in all these other lovely countries in Asia, I guess predominantly, and comparing it to the UK. And there's a couple of studies I'm going to mention today, but one in particular that I saw was done back in 2018. I'm just going to talk a little bit about it because I think it's quite interesting. Uh, it was looking at the relationship between household income and child subjective well-being. And I assume you're familiar with that term, yeah. subjective well-being. And uh, those who are listening, it's just basically how you view you are in terms of your well-being level. And they uh, looked at just over a thousand parent-child relationships, age 10 to 16. And they found a direct and indirect correlation between the level of income, level of deprivation in the household, the child's perception of family sharing practices which i thought was really interesting so that's them looking at you know the relationship between the parents um when it comes to money and sharing money or the older siblings uh and that like i said has a direct impact on the individual or the child's you know level of well-being and i thought that was really fascinating because i think previously studies have just said okay if you come from a high income household you're, you're going to be absolutely fine and actually there's so much more in the detail right um so I kind of wanted to put it to you in terms of your experience in working in different countries. Do you notice much in terms of the child's perception um, and their, you know, sense of agency when it comes to them being wealthy or what they understand about money? Yeah, no, so it's a really interesting question. So one of the points, just before I go into the different countries, is about the, the family dynamics. And I think that's so, so important because parent children are just absorbing. They're just, especially there's not many conversations about money, so they're just picking it up by absorbing. And so the way in which the sort of guardian spouse uh, parents are, are talking about money between themselves, it's going to be picked up very quickly, even if it's not in the same room, but just the way in which you behave. So it's really important that parents kind of do get together and say, right, if we're going to teach our kids about money, what's our kind of family values about this? What do we believe about pocket money? What do we believe about spending and trying to be together on that as possible because i've heard of some stories where it's like right one parent's going to be like i want my kids to learn about the value of money and the other parents are like i just want them to love me they can have whatever they want <laughs> um and clearly that's just very confusing for the child so having and, that just, alignment. Just, uh, and just to kind of just to kind of run with that for a second and i think even you know the way you worded it just now i think even further it you know if the parent has an intention to teach the child about money and you know you said they may think about how you know, they need to think about how they want to teach the child about money, what they want to, what message they want to pass on. But I think even just going back to what you said at the beginning of that, even if they don't actively decide to teach the child about money, they are teaching their child about money because of exactly what we're talking about, right? The child is just picking it up like a sponge. Oh, yeah, and that's a really important point because so it goes back to the kind of habits piece. And for, for many kids, um, I say they're not taught about money, but they're kind of learning themselves. And so what happens then is two things. One, a lot of the time spending gets reinforced so it's kind of they all, they see money's getting spent but also when they get given money for like birthdays or two fairy or wherever it may be a lot of adults will say to them what are you going to go and spend that money on so again it's just in their little brains this is going money spending money spending money but then when they get a bit older they realize that money isn't spoken about generally and therefore what that starts to go into their minds is that if it's not spoken about it must be a bad thing a bit like swearing, like hopefully most parents aren't swearing, um, but the absence of swearing kind of reinforces the fact that it's, it's a negative piece. And again, the kid's going to pick up on that very, very strongly. So even if you're not sitting out and saying, right, we've got a plan to teach our kids about money, a lot of the time you're teaching them, whether it's about spending or about money is a bad topic, and we need to change that um, from a youngest age. Um, but yeah, so going back to your question about different countries, it's been really fascinating. So yeah, so we've, we've been London, Hong Kong, which are two of kind of the most affluent cities. Um, and then we've been in Vietnam and now Thailand. And it's been really interesting to see that dynamic. So when we're in Hong Kong, for example, 
there, there is just a lot of um, affluence around. So you've, you, d you don't really see the other side of that. But what you do see is the, the children, some of them can just take money for granted because, again, they go out to these not even fancy restaurants, but just general restaurants. They'll ask, and it's so, so expensive. Granted, there's a sort of pay compensates the, the parents for that, but then it's really hard for the, to sort of justify right, how much is it worth. <clears throat> what was really interesting was going to, to Vietnam, where clearly it's a very much a developing country. And so even like people on the mobile phone still have the old phones with the, 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 the physical buttons rather than that. But it was a great experience for my kids because they got to see this change from uh, Hong Kong to this. Uh, but yet the interesting thing for the kids side, in Vietnam, all the kids were super happy. They were out playing outside. They were playing with sticks and tires. And, and I remember just one day that we had this little stream outside our house. And my daughters and the local children were just building like paper uh, boats and then having little races down the stream. And it's fantastic. Again, just they didn't have that because no, because there wasn't much wealth around. It wasn't as if there was the haves and the haves nots. It was kind of everyone's in a similarish kind of boat. And so everyone didn't really think about it and everyone just got on with their, their lives. But so I think there's that kind of, it's a relative thing. So you can have p people in the UK who have a significant amount more than those in Vietnam, for example, but still feel relatively poor to relative to, to everyone else. And that can have a really big impact on their mindset around gratitude to what they have, but also the relative like, hardships um, that come with that. But what was really a, so a nice little story that my daughters got to observe when in Vietnam. So we was, were there during COVID and clearly it's quite a touristy area. So it's a little place called Hoi An, beautiful place. I highly recommend everyone. I've been, I've been, I've been. <laughs> so, so nice. Um, but beautiful. it does have quite a big tourist. So all the tourists left because of COVID. But some of the restaurants clearly who relied on, on tourists. So we got to know a couple of the families who run these very very well and they were saying to us oh can you think of any ideas in which we can maybe make some more money um, because okay we, i was pretty much the only customer some days that they had and so we kind of thought about it my wife and i and we said to them, oh, maybe you should open for breakfasts because again you, you might not get many customers but at least that's an extra meal that you're cooking and what's really interesting my, my daughters were there at the time they said oh we thought about that but we don't want to do that because the people across the road who we know serve breakfast and we don't want to take away any of the money from them and I was just like wow that's and it, there's another coffee shop which was owned by a, a Singaporean and so we used to go there sometimes and he shut down during COVID and we asked him afterwards and he said I could have opened but again I didn't want those customers the people the Vietnamese coffee shops needed those customers more than I did and so I just love the fact that there wasn't much money but yet the way in which they thought about money, about this community and looking after each other was just, wow. And I was just like, I always thought, would you get that in the UK? You might do, but it was just so, because it, it wasn't just one case, one really nice person. It seemed like everyone in the whole place. So I think it was really interesting, that kind of dynamic about money, not having much, but caring about the, the average rather than the, the, yeah. the one. That is so fascinating. And I think to me that just screams the, and highlights the difference in the value system yeah. and what we or people as a, a community or a culture place the most value on and there obviously it's not material at all it's kind of community and your peers and the people you're connected with and I you know obviously I'm from London and I know people talk a lot about how many different people there are in London and maybe that takes away that that sense of closeness yeah. um you know to, to kind of compare to some of that that value stuff and just going back as well, I just wanted to pick up on the point you made initially, and it just made me think of social ranking. So when you're talking about, well, everyone's at a similar kind of level in terms of, you know, income, and and you're right, social comparison maybe is smaller if everybody is similar, um, which then impacts exactly what we're talking about. So that, yeah, that's really fascinating. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, it was quite interesting because you clearly did have people who had different levels of income in sure. Vietnam. It was interesting though. I remember, we, so every Wednesday before school, I would take one of my daughters to this, um, so it's a fur restaurant, or so uh, soup noodles. Um, and it's just a very local place. So it's, they only served one dish. It was all kind of 
metal tables and plastic stools. It's like 50p per bolt. It's really, really tasty. The best, the best. Uh, if you haven't been, it's the best. <laughs> So we used to go there, and then I remember talking to someone whilst we were there, and they said, oh, do you see that person over there? Uh, it's like an, a kind of older gentleman, again, wearing shorts, T-shirt, flip-flops, a uh, Vietnamese guy, and they're like, oh, he's the wealthiest person in the whole of um, Hoi An. He owns, like, these restaurants and this uh, tailor suit chain. And yet he had no no flashes about him. He was just there enjoying his restaurant. I'm guessing he's been to the same place for like the last 30 years or whatever it was. But I think also because if, if he had turned up in like a Rolls Royce and a nice suit, he would have just been so out of place <laughs> and everyone would be looking. Whereas I think he just wants to have that piece. Like, so again, even the social bits, it's not that kind of look at me, I've made my money. It's more, I've been fortunate, but I'm still enjoy what I, what I enjoy um, and stick around. I think if he really wanted to show off he would probably move to the one of the bigger cities uh, in there so it's, yeah it's really nice as you say it's that social ranking is it's not there even though the, the sort of disparity in, in wealth is probably still not probably not as wealth uh, as vast but still clearly what uh, vast yeah it still exists so fascinating um and kind of we touched on this a little bit earlier but this makes me want to bring in um the whole delayed gratification and i just couldn't do this episode without mentioning the marshmallow test right yes. i'm sure you've, you've heard of it yes. and actually kind of progressing on further from that marshmallow test i don't know if you've come across the study i did in 2018 i think 2018 was the year of looking at children and money relationships but they did another one where they were basically the findings of it debunked kind of what they found in the marshmallow test and they found that actually children from lower caste homes had more difficulty resisting treats than wealthier children so they actually found that it's about the you know level of poverty or wealth affluence in the household that impacted whether they you know held back from marshmallows and actually that reflected other things you know when you're from a a poorer background you're more likely to prefer something now because of your experience of not possibly getting that thing if you wait. Yeah. Um, which I think is really fascinating because that goes back to the question, which I know, and just assuming, you know, you, t you teach children more so than I, but the whole wants and needs, you know, conversation. Um, yeah, no, it's a really, really interesting. So yeah, the, the marshmallow experiment. So as I say, I think as they refined it, so I, I, I assume uh, just for clarity, for those who might not know, they, it was in the seven, late 70s, they put essentially a group of children and said, you've got a choice between one marshmallow now or wait 15 minutes and you can have two marshmallows. And then they um, sort of observed them over time and those who waited seemed to have sort of better outcomes, not just in finances, but in terms of relationships and, and careers, etc. What was really interesting, if one of those, there was this little girl and they showed a video. And so she actually picked up the marshmallow and hollowed it out and ate the middle of it so it looked like it hadn't been eaten so she's either in prison or a ceo one of the two <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious <laughs> but yeah as you mentioned they refined the the studies to look at different social groups so i think there was still a correlation if you looked within the uh, same uh class uh same sort of social piece and then but yeah relative to there's a strong piece and yeah i think there's a huge um disparity and the same thing with it's like um, lottery tickets as well so there's a big study in america about who buys lottery tickets and most of the time it's the um it's the lower income families because they're they're very much like well i'd rather have something a chance of something great now because something slightly better even if i didn't spend that money and got i don't it's not going to materially change whereas having something now that i has a chance or it's just here and now gives me that level of euphoria straight away which they, they've kind of been missing it's just harder so clearly when kids are from wealthier backgrounds um i generally have everything they ever want and stuff so they can make that choice it's kind of easy it's like well a marshmallow is not that special to me so <laughs> i can wait a little bit and have two marshmallows two is better than one but clearly for a child who doesn't get that much and therefore the level of excitement that they can get for um, that shorter get term game is clearly much higher. So I think there's, we have to take these kind of considerations into to account. And it's actually, it's a, a blog that I've recently um, just written about is judging people too early and about why people take certain actions. 
And it's not just because they're lazy or stupid or whatever it is. It's, there's a lot of stories behind that. And some of that just could be the, the social upbringing that they had. They didn't have the opportunities. Um, and therefore, when certain bits come to them or they didn't have the education, they're going to react very differently to those who had education, family support, uh, wealth. <laughs> They've had so many different experiences and therefore make differences. And I think that's just so, so important that we take that into consideration. So I do believe that all families can teach their kids about money regardless. But it's clearly not going to, it's going to be harder and more challenging, more hurdles to overcome for some than it is for others. But at the same time, I think there's, I've met so, so many people from very wealthy families. Um, they've sort of grown up and they're, they're struggling with money now. They're, they've got money traumas. Again, I know some people will be like, oh, don't feel sorry for the rich. But actually, these children, they didn't choose to come from a rich family. They, they, they kind of got into these social groups where everyone's just spending so much and then they're, they're left on their own after their parents have said, oh, we're not <laughs> financing you anymore. And then they're like, oh, no, but I, I kind of live up to this very high level and now you're telling me I can't. And it's very, very traumatic. And so it's, it's always got to be right for the, the child based on their background and making sure if they're from a, a kind of more deprived background, you've got to give them that sense that it is possible <laughs> if you take the certain actions. Because a lot of, from the sort of, I say, more deprived families, the hardest thing for them when it comes to money is believing that they can have money in the future. Because they don't, they don't feel they have it now. They don't see the people around them having it. And so you have to give them that sense of taking away that sort of limiting self-belief around money and say, look, you, if you do believe, and again, hopefully in the book, I've got these characters that come from different backgrounds. So one has the main character, she's got this wealthy grandfather, the other one, the friend that she meets comes from a relatively poor family, but they both kind of go on this journey together. And again, I was kind of very conscious to have these different backgrounds to ensure that it's not just money's for this type of family of <laughs> got both parents and wealthy and, and everyone around them has got lots of money. It's all about oh, what you do with your money, whereas clearly it's about, even if you have a little bit of money, if you still have that belief and you take certain actions, it is possible. I love that. And I like the fact that you, of course, brought it back to kind of limiting beliefs and money stories effectively. And obviously with my work, I work with adults. Uh, you know, my focus on adults are outside the education system. They're hard to reach. That's what I've given myself a challenge for. <laughs> um, but it, it's great to hear that, of course, that all shows up with children as well. That's where it starts. And actually, it's something that can be addressed earlier in life and understanding, OK, this is what the narrative is that, that the child holds around money, which is maybe influencing the fact that they eat the marshmallow straight away, you know. And I think even that narrative and the conversation we're having here and for those who are new, you know, talking about money and being good at money is not just about numbers it is about the stuff that comes is around it you know what you believe what you think what you feel um your experiences what, what your truth is um which all yeah. impacts you as you go through life right yeah, yeah and one of the so I, I love sharing the story about the so a guy called ronald reed um so he's the famous janitor in the u.s and so he worked as like in a petrol station in America, sort of just filling up cars. And then he worked as a janitor part-time for like JC Penney. So throughout his whole career, he never earned very much money. But when he died at like 92, his family realized that he had about 8 million in US dollars in investments. And he donated that uh, as part of his will to the, the schools, uh, the library and the, the hospital that looked after him in his, his later years. But I just really love that story because it shows he didn't have a very strong education and he didn't ever earn that much money, but yet he still became like one of the wealthiest people in the world, so top 1% of the whole world, just because he took that little bit of time to understand the basics and then he did that the basics over and over and over and over <laughs> for many, many years. And again, I, I love that story because it kind of takes away some of those limiting beliefs that you have to come from a rich family who's very educated and you have to earn lots of money. Uh, it's not a case at all. Um, it's about yeah, controlling, having the right habits, mindset, and repeating uh, forevermore. I love that, and thank you for sharing that. And yeah, repeating, lazy. <laughs> um, it doesn't matter how much income. It's all about what you do and the actions you take, which is exactly how you started this. So thank you. Um, 
I, I don't know if this if you can answer this question, but I do wonder again out of curiosity in terms of um, what we know when it comes to adults talking about money. Right? There's mm -hmm. often shame, embarrassment. Does that appear with children? Um, not so much. Well, so my daughters are eight and um, ten, but mm. there, there, there will be because even my eldest has every now and then said, oh, but my friend has this. Um, and again, that's just a bit of, oh, if I don't have this, then I'm not, I might be left out from my friends. And so again, this kind of rich versus wealthy and so, well, yeah. we have some, we, we kind of choose um, what we do with our money and we, this is what we chose to, to spend our money on. And again, we go back to the um, rich versus wealthy and we say, well, we've got some what we call blue trees, which is our kind of savings investments. And so that gives us the opportunity to have spent time with you and, uh, and not work. We'd rather have that than spend it on other things. And so again, it has to be reinforced over and over and over again. It's not just a one, tell them once and it's done. Because as you say, it's going to have that social pressure uh, coming through. But clearly it's not so much about shame. I think it's just kind of that wanting to keep up with friends. But I'm, I'm going to guess by the time it gets into sort of mid-teens, um, I'm guessing it's going to be just as there. But what's really interesting, I just on that about the shame piece. I'd, so I, every now and then I do some workshops with some companies. So it's like a lunchtime, how to teach your kids about money session. And I, was, I did one for a large financial services company in the UK. Um, and it was really interesting because the month before, they had another provider come in to talk to them, the, their employees about debt, debt management. And the turnout for the, my workshop was much higher. And that's nothing to do with the fact that it's, it was me or anything like that. It was just a topic. And so they started to ask some people around why they came to one and not the other. And it was really interesting because the, the people who said, I really wanted to go to the debt one, but I didn't want people to know that I was going to the debt one. And it's always just because they just thought if they go to it, people, whereas for my one, it's like, well, if even if they learn something about money, that no one's going to judge them except for you're a good guardian for looking, thinking about your children getting them and they might learn something but going to the debt so there's a course and the employer's like I want to help you I'm going to put on this piece but people didn't show up because they're ashamed that people would judge them for seeking help and I think that's the state of play with adults and um, it's it's yeah hard hard challenge just kudos to yourself <laughs> and others because it's 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 def it's most definitely needed it's and i think challenge. like podcast that is the best way because i say it gives that a lot of that information without people kind of getting that judgment on them yeah and and thank you again for showing that and you're spot on it is you know when i do same i do workshops for corporates as well and I actively make an effort to facilitate an environment where people can learn what they need to learn and avoid the shame, not be center of attention for their question, you know, send questions to the speaker directly, you know, it doesn't have to go into the general space or send yeah. the question, but you know, or exactly because, you know, I'm sure more people would have gone to the debt talk and benefit, you know, benefited and as a result had better finances, but because of shame and embarrassment, which is what happens, you yeah. know, in our society as we get older. Um, so yeah. Um, great work that you're doing again and, and and I think we mentioned this on our previous chat the fact that you talking to parents about their children's money gives them an excuse to learn about money in a safe environment because it's not really about them inverted commas yeah, <laughs> yeah. no it's that Trojan horse because um, yeah some of the topics I talk about is like so like one of the most popular blogs I mentioned earlier was how to teach your kids about the stock market and I was using McDonald's I was using Lego and I got loads of comments from parents saying I learned something new about this myself um, I probably wouldn't have read it if it wasn't based on my kids if it was just how to learn about the stock market they would have probably they thought well it's going to be too complicated it's not for me but oh it might be interesting to see how I can teach my kids and because I was using let's say McDonald's and, and Lego and, and Blockbuster Video as these examples um, and it actually got picked up by the Financial Times and, and run from there and so again it just takes that little bit of um edge away from it's not about me it's I want to learn something and actually as I'm teaching trying to teach them in a way which they can teach their kids so I'm using I say these simple analogies it's actually quite level to the most where most adults are because most most adults have never been taught about money at all so when they think oh I've got to go and learn about P ratios and I've got to learn about dividends and different tax and all the acronyms that come with that it's very very daunting 
Whereas actually, oh, if I'm teaching about kids and if I learn something else, um, it's fantastic. And I love hearing uh, stories of messages from parents saying, oh, I read this and we've st- set up an account for our kids. And whilst we're doing it, we set up an account for ourselves. So it's kind of using it as a catalyst to change their own uh, behaviors and trying to be a bit of a role model for their kids as well, which is yeah, fantastic. I love it. You've basically put this scary money conversation in a nice, sweet, tasty wrapper that, yes. you know, <laughs> I'm just doing it for the kids. It's, you know, big excuse. I'm just going to, but I'm going to eat it too. <laughs> um, so for, and, and you know, we're coming near, you know, we're approaching the end, but in terms of those parents who maybe haven't done anything in terms of teaching their children about money, kind of, what would you say is the first step? I mean, I will say it would obviously be re- reading your book, right? <laughs> But after that, what would you say is the first step kind of to start that? Yeah. So if they can afford to do so, is to try and give kids some pocket money. Um, just because pocket money allows kids to make money decisions from a young age. And if you kind of encourage them to save a little bit every time they get some, then they can start building these habits. As we mentioned, it's, money is so much about habits and consistency that if they get some money, and so if, get, if they only get money on special occasions, it's gonna become so novel. It's gonna be like the, the one marshmallow, and it's like, well, actually, if I don't have any eggs, uh, don't have many marshmallows, I, I wanna eat it straight away. So giving them just a little, it doesn't really matter about the amount. It's more about giving them some and saying, right, you can spend most of it, but just keep a little bit. So if you give them a pound, just even 10p, getting them to save that, and over time, as the money they receive or they earn gets bigger they're into that habit so so when they're older and hopefully by that time it's how come she's got so much savings oh it's just what i've always done and again it's all about that habit of just saving a little bit and it's not about teaching them to just save their money because we don't want to get into the the other extreme it's all about balance and say spend most of it enjoy it make some spending decisions make, make some mistakes as well much better for kids to make mistakes around uh, did you really think about that purchase or did you, did you buy it uh, spontaneously? Next time you've got it, what are you going to spend it on? Are you gonna... And again, the more that they get to make those decisions and make those mistakes, the, the better. Because most adults never had that opportunity to take those responsibilities on. And then they um, spend with much bigger amounts of money and it has bigger impact or they invest for the first time and it's super scary and then they lose lots of money and it's it's all too too experience with kids doing it in small small amounts but consistently they're going to have that that wealth of experience by the time they're 18 and i say i think that's going to give them a huge advantage so it's not about first thing it's not giving them big lectures just that small small habit it's it's simple but super effective thank you for that and, and exactly as you ended it it is really simple actually when you break it down to just giving them a little bit of money it doesn't have to be 50 100 pounds it could be tiny bits of money that they they can just control. Um, thank you. Pleasure. It will be great for you to share uh, where people can find you. Yeah. So yeah, so my, my blog uh, website is uh, bluetreesavings.com, which you mentioned at the start. So every week I release a new uh, blog, which teaches about, well, helps parents teach their kids about a new topic, whether that's, I say, savings, debts, but sometimes how does McDonald's make money or fast fashion or even the 2008 financial crisis, all in sort of simple, this is how I taught my daughters. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn is where I'm doing, I'm most active in terms of um, giving little tips. So I try and do maybe four or five posts uh, in a week. So just look up Will Rainey and you should see me on there. Um, and yeah, and my book's on, on Amazon. So uh, Grandpa's Fortune Fables, so that's for kids who are between sort of six and 12, um, but parents can read it with younger children as well. And I'm hoping the parents do read it with their kids and hopefully get a few little tips themselves. Thank you. And also, is there anything you'd like to share in terms of what's coming up for you? Is there anything that you can share with the listeners? Yeah, so I'm I'm still doing some more workshops and I've started my own little podcast um, called Epic Real World Money Stories. So a lot of the stories that I share with my kids um, are based on real world stories so like the the Ronald Reed the janitor one I mentioned earlier so I found them really interesting so I thought I'd share them uh, on a podcast which I've only got a few episodes out at the moment um, but yes yeah, so, I'm going to work on a new book so I'm actually writing another book with my uh, eldest daughter um, so it's going to be because my daughter's growing up so the kind of stories that I'm sharing with them kind of evolves as well so I'm not sure when that'll be out maybe at the end of this year if not early next year but I'm super excited about that amazing well 
Thank you so much for joining me. This has been so much fun and we covered some really interesting topics and you shared some really interesting stories. Um, yeah. So thank, uh, you. thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure.